Hello! Today's stories come from r slash Entitled People. We've got three stories. First up, Crazy Karen Neighbor Has Pushed Too Far. Last night, I posted about my Karen neighbor, and well, last night she pushed too far. My girlfriend and I were outside on the front deck playing video games. I brought the TV out so we could play some games, have a beer, and just enjoy the evening. It wasn't late, about dusk at 7 p.m. My girl and I are having a few rounds of Mario Kart 64, in my opinion, the best one. When Karen gets home and marches over on her hinds to ask, what do you think you're doing? She was referring to the TV on the deck, the beer in hands, or the general enjoyment of life. I replied, just enjoying our evening. Karen told me to take all the junk and my harlot inside, that it's not the place for this debauchery. And that's when she finally pushed too far and I snapped. I stood up and told her to shut her mouth, get the frack off my property, or I'm going to drag her off. Karen laughed at me saying, I have no idea what's going on. Karen said she sees cars and men going into my home all day when I'm at work. Karen's not wrong. A lot of people stop by during the day to see me. She has the girlfriend's car and mine mixed up. She doesn't realize I basically am working from home. I get even more upset and walk to the stairs to confront her, and she waddles back to her house in a hurry. Cops show up 30 minutes later with a complaint. Today I went to the police station and they gave me reason 7,894 why I hate them. They refused to do anything about her. They wouldn't take a report, nothing. They said it's a personal matter, it's my problem. They told me to just stay inside if she doesn't like me on the deck because it's causing them problems. The only flipping reason I chose this house was that beautiful front deck. I saw it as a perfect hangout for my friends and I. Well. Today I had plans to take the bikes out with my crew and cruise down the highway. But because of all this, plans change. I called one of my buddies, Bruce. We call him Hot Dog. He is a hot dog vendor downtown Toronto. Bruce got the word out about the change of plans. Now the revenge is a very simple thing. Drive Karen crazy, upset the cops, and just enjoy life. So I'm going to leave out some important information until we get to the point the cops arrive. Some information about my friends and I, we are all big, burly men. Most of us are covered in tattoos. And if I said a biker, that's what we look like. Except for Frost, he's a short munchkin. My friends get to my place at about 1 p.m. You could hear them arrive, six very big, very loud Harleys pull up in your drive. The entire house shakes. It's a thing of beauty. The crew dismounts and we start our day just having a grand old time on the front of my place. Karen eventually waddles her rudder out of her house and we crank up the music. This time, it was Barbie Girl. When she starts walking over to my home, we just all start booing her. Karen stops dead in her tracks, jaw almost hitting the ground, and walks back into her home. We went back to enjoying our lives. Cops show up. Now, it's time to describe what was actually going on. Well, cops pull up and they step out. The looks on their face it was glorious. Picture this, seven big, burly, most of us bearded, tattooed men, sitting shirtless in shorts, sitting at a full-size poker table. Yeah, I brought out my poker table. Playing cards with money on the table, smoking the skunk with a few beers. All perfectly legal. Check the bylaws as long as it's at least five feet away from the public sidewalk. Well, cops were miffed. They are getting annoyed being called to my house now on a daily basis. They want me to just do whatever Karen wants. After some words and some fast talk from my buddy, Soup Boy, his last name is Campbell. He's a criminal defense lawyer. He works as legal aid lawyer. The cops knew there was nothing they could do. I told the cops that if they don't do something about Karen, this is going to happen every single day until they tell her to stop being a birch tree. Cops went over to Karen's, and she came outside, did some fake crying, pointing, and screaming at us big, burly, shirtless men. As she was doing that, we got extra mischievous and turned on the sprinkler. So now we have Karen screaming and crying to the cops, frustrated cops, and seven big, burly, tattooed shirtless men in short, short, shorts, prancing through a sprinkler, now with classics from the Backstreet Boys playing on the stereo. Cops came back to talk to us to ask how long we were going to be. 
We said, all day. When they went back to their car, we waved bye and said, see you tomorrow. Karen closed all the curtains in her house, and my friends just called taxis to go to their respective hotels. We're doing this all again tomorrow. Oh, I need to add something. My 70-year-old neighbor on the other side came out at around 6 p.m. to see what was going on. I love this guy. He's an old-school hippie. He sat down and had a joint with us. He gets harassed by Karen a lot and hopes we keep it up. He's going to come over tomorrow with a few prizes from his homegrown stash, so score. Tomorrow is going to be fun. I can totally picture this, and it's amazing. Nothing like a little aqua to set the mood for revenge. Let's head straight to the comments where there are some pretty funny extra details from OP. Tiptoe said, If Bruce the hot dog vendor in Toronto used to be Bruce the hot dog vendor in Windsor, on Sandpoint Beach, then I had a huge crush on him in the mid-late 90s. OP replied, Huh, no, Bruce is only in his mid-30s. But you can see him at one of his three carts. The one he mostly tends is near Ryerson University. You can also find his other cart near the Rogers Centre, and his other one near Hart Hall downtown. You can't miss him. He's clean-shaven, tall, and lanky, and slim. He's six foot five inches. Also hurts my feelings that I'm six foot three inches, and not even in the top three tallest in the crew. But you can't miss him. Tall, lanky, kind of looks like Chris Pratt had a baby with Mr. Bean. Jaime said, I had a recurring problem with a neighbor and the cops telling me to do what he says, and he'll stop bothering me. I filed two police harassment complaints, saying that if they refuse to enforce the law equally, then they are clearly helping him harass me. Both complaints ended with a finding that yes, the cops were incorrect, but no, they weren't harassing me. After the second complaint, I saw the sergeant talking to the neighbor, and that was the last time the cops came to my house. Lestan shared, Cops shouldn't tell you to not use your deck to appease a twit waffle. They are admitting their negligence. You need to file a restraining order against her so you can document the harassment. She came into your place and took pics. She's going to get worse and maybe really cause you some issues. Cops don't want to get involved. Sue her butt in civil court for punitive damages. Also, get a projector for the deck and smash bros. Our second story has some great entitlement coming from a sibling who stepped over the line. It reads, Sister demands $50,000 of my time from my job. I'm an accountant at a big four firm, yellow line for those that know, and my sister is a stay-at-home mom with three kids. I am 27 years old, have no kids, and make $135,000 Canadian a year in salary. The way my job works is I get billed out to clients at a specified rate, and then my firm pays me my salary. Being an accountant, I get a pretty good view of all things business-related. My entitled sister wants to start a business. Great! That will provide them with some extra income since supporting three kids on a single income can be very difficult. It was February, and I was in the thick of busy season, the time leading up to when all the public audits are due essentially. It's long, 12 to 15 hour days for months at a time. My sister decided to get her business plan up and running, and she needed some help. I told her that I would not be able to help her until May. This wasn't a good enough answer for her. She wanted to get the funding for her business for April so she could start setting up operations in May. She demanded that I work after work for free building her a business plan, building out controls that I would eventually have to implement, designing business processes, and then getting her the funding from the bank that she wanted for the business. I shrugged it off until she called my boss. She called my boss, a very lovely but serious managing partner, asking if I could get some time off in the middle of the busy season to help her start her business. My boss's number is public on the firm's website, so that's how she got it. This is not okay. My boss came to my office and told me what happened and told me that if I wanted a vacation, I needed to give them more notice and that usually it wasn't approved. I was confused because I didn't request any time off. He said, name called, and I knew exactly what she had done. I was fuming gagged, gooped, and guffawed, to say the least. I called her up and told her to never call my work to try and get me time off in the middle of the busiest time of year. She was super angry that I could not help her. She ended up going to my mom, a retired chartered accountant, CA, for help. She is retired and doesn't want to work anymore unless she is getting her pay rate from when she was working, 
which is approximately $1,625 an hour. At the family dinner we have on Sunday, she brings up the fact that nobody in the family is willing to help her get her business off the ground. My mom mentioned that she couldn't afford her rate, in a way meaning she didn't want to do the work because she is retired. I told her that I couldn't take off two weeks of my life to get her whole business off the ground and ready for operations. I would be able to do it part-time in the spring or summer for opening the next spring. She didn't like that answer. Again. I told her that I can sign her through my firm first thing Monday morning, but she would have to pay the $50,000 retainer and signing fee. She explodes and leaves and agreed to have my work on it for free in the spring and summer. I didn't say it was going to be free, but it was going to be a heavily discounted rate of $45 to $50 an hour, not the $650 that my firm charges for my time to clients. Seriously? I'm not sure I'd be keen on helping anyone this entitled, even if they are family. OP's sister strikes me as the type to challenge everything and anything, even though she has no idea what she's talking about. And I say that because she clearly has no clue as to how businesses function, nor does she care to respect anyone. Don't do it, OP. And heading over to the comments, we'll find some good advice about doing business with family. My advice would be to not do business with family. Granny Turtle said, do not work a single minute without a contract and get paid up front. Deep said, don't work for family, period, in my opinion. I get if it's something small, but this sounds huge and costly. Being family is a huge conflict of interest between contractor and contractee. My personal rule is always offer family full price because you support them. Conversely, if you are the one doing the work, it's in my opinion not worth charging for something small, a few hours to a day at most. Dragonbard added, Another reason not to. If something goes wrong, even if it's not your fault, you get blamed and it becomes family drama. Jungle Rumble shared, As someone who worked for an entirely different Big Four firm, Think Green Dot, I am mortified for you. Busy season is rough without outside drama. To ring your boss is just... OMG. If someone who wants to start a business can't write their own business plan, then I'm quite afraid of the outcome. Draw up your engagement letter outlining all terms and conditions and payment schedules before you even give an ounce of oxygen to this business. Raise your rate at least another $10 per hour as an annoyance tax, because you know she will make you work for every cent. Pan Pan shared, Your sister is expecting you to set up her entire business by yourself? The loan will need to be gotten in her name, right? And banks require you to present your materials as a way to show them you've done your research and know the market because it's basically an audition to show them you're a worthwhile investment. If you're doing all the work and she can't present that to the bank, she's showing she's a bad risk. Kelly Ope added, I thought the same thing. She's not asking for his help or advice. She's asking for him to do all the work for free, so she doesn't have to. She should be doing these things herself if she wants to be a business owner. Our third story gives insight into what one comment will later call the restaurant syndrome. It's titled, Pass the Pepper for Pete's Sake. Entitled customer steals from my table. I like fresh ground pepper. My wife likes fresh ground pepper. My friends like fresh ground pepper. I particularly like it on my weekly Sunday breakfast, which, as it happens, takes place in the same local neighborhood diner as it has for 10 years. Alas, this diner deploys simple pepper shakers inadequate for our tastes. So we bring along our own per size mill. This diner, I should further point out, is generally patronized by regulars each Sunday morning, and we are on smile-and-wave basis with most of them. As usual, this past Sunday we were enjoying our breakfast, talking, laughing over stupid jokes, the usual. At the table to our immediate right was a couple of about mid-fifties, same as us, but unfamiliar to us, not regulars. And the man had a loud voice, so loud, in fact, that he made our conversation a little difficult. During a lull in our conversation, I heard him say, pass the pepper. My friends then mentioned that they were going for a bike ride later and wondered if we'd like to join them. I thought it over, and just as I was about to answer, I heard a scraping of a chair from the next table. Suddenly, the man with the loud voice was looming over our table. I said, pass the pepper, Dagnabbit. He barked and reached across the table to grab my peppermill. A cacophony of protests, surprise, queries, and exclamations followed. I managed to block his hand and looked up at him. Hey, what are you doing? I demanded. 
My friend, a very mild-mannered and gentle man, jumped to his feet and squared up. Pass the pepper, the man snarled again. What is so hard to understand? I quickly slid the pepper mill off the table and into my pocket. Then I, too, stood up. The pepper? I asked. You mean my pepper? That isn't the communal pepper. What is wrong with you? He shouted. I want the dang pepper. At this point, his wife, girlfriend, companion, quicker on the uptake, realized his mistake and tried to get his attention. Roy? Roy? Sit down. It's not Roy. Listen. She tried. But Roy, doubling down and in high dudgeon, was not to be denied. Get that mother father's pepper out of your pocket and hand it over now. Eyes were uncomfortably on us. Other tables were watching this play out in surprise and shock. At this point, a server approached with her arms full of someone else's breakfast. Hey guys, not sure what's going on, but I have hot food here coming through. As she passed, Roy shouted again, and this time threw his hands in the air in a what gesture. It all happened in a blur, and before the server could deek, she was covered in sunny-side-up eggs, home fries, and sausage. Roy! The woman screamed. What in the world? Hey, watch out! Oh no! And a dozen other exclamations from the onlookers erupted all at once. Crap! Roy shouted. See what you did? His wife had scrambled to her feet to assist the server who dropped the second plate as well. My wife also got up to help and the owner, Donna, a sweet-faced 65-year-old, suddenly emerged from the kitchen. What is going on? She said alarmed. Everyone started talking at once and Roy, Alpha Roy, shouted over everyone. This butthole, indicating me, wouldn't pass me the pepper, he roared. Donna gaped uncomprehendingly at him for a moment. She looked at the mess on the floor, the now red-faced and furious Roy, other customers, and then at me. He, what? There's pepper on your table. Roy, his wife screamed again. Apologize now and sit down. It's my pepper mill, I said again, not the restaurant's. Fracking idiot, Roy shouted. Why didn't you say something, jerkhole? I laughed out loud and looked with amazed surprise at my friend. He stared straight at Roy and said in a quiet but firm voice, Listen to your wife and sit down. Donna looked around at the mess in confusion. At this point, approximately 45 seconds had elapsed since Roy first lurched to his feet to steal my pepper. I think I'm going to have to ask you to leave, she said to Roy. I can't have this in my restaurant. Roy's wife, nearly in tears, began apologizing rapidly and repeatedly. Roy started protesting and demanding that he get to eat his breakfast. Donna, sweet-faced but tough, told him he could leave voluntarily or she would have the police assist him. Roy, now, his wife said. She left a wad of money on the table and grabbed his arm, pulling him to the door. I am so sorry, she said to Donna and the server. I guess he loves his pepper too. Classic case of a curmudgeon. I feel for Roy's wife seemed to me like she was quite accustomed to dealing with these types of outbursts. Unsurprisingly, Roy gets flamed in the comments, but we'll also find an explanation of the restaurant syndrome. Let's check him out. In response to, Frocking idiot, Roy shouted, Why didn't you say something, butthole? Sour Brit said, Um, OP did say something, Roy. The pepper? I asked. You mean my pepper? This isn't the communal pepper. Sour Brit added, problem is, you were too busy throwing a tantrum to listen. Someone else said, tantrums seem to go hand in hand with selective hearing a bit too often. Jerkface Bob added, but usually in much younger children. Adam Skeeter shared, some people don't listen. They assume and then want the world to bend to fit their thoughts. Even if you tell them flat out what the deal is, it's all in one ear and out the other because it doesn't match with what they think should be happening. Also, if someone said, Pass the pepper at another table, I sure wouldn't think they were talking to me. So maybe he should turn down the anger levels at being ignored. Bancroft79 shared, Also, there is restaurant syndrome. For some people, usually self-absorbed, over-entitled buttholes, it is assumed that since they are being served, they get to behave like a petulant toddler and are also the only people in the room. They are the type that bring a party of 20 without a reservation at 7 on a Friday and have a fit when they find out 
that it may be 45 minutes until they can get a table. They order a well-done steak and start asking, what is taking so long after seven minutes? They are also the types that expect busy servers and bartenders to read their mind or interpret their vague descriptions of things that they mutter under their breath. I imagine they are also like this at the grocery store, dry cleaners, dentist office, etc. In all the years I worked in the restaurant biz, it amazed me how many people thought opening their wallet to purchase a dinner out gave them carte blanche to behave like an absolute butt stain. If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks, and bye for now.